This is a good question. How to develop DevOps design for an application? Is there any certain points to consider when creating deployment architecture of an application? These are some general guidelines. Let's not talk about tools because I don't know what tools you're using. There's a couple of things that I look at. This is a great question because it goes to first principles of DevOps. And so the first thing I do is if someone needs a refresher on the origins of DevOps, it was a large portion of it, it was around culture and people and processes. So we won't go into all of that. But the other part of that was around how to build your systems so that they are agile. Now, I'm not talking specifically about agile development. I'm just saying that your systems are flexible enough so that a team can collaborate together and easily deploy that application anywhere. That, that's whether that's on your local machine, whether that's on a cloud or on-prem or something in your closet. All of this should be easily repeatable and that it's not completely different to run it locally than it is in the cloud versus on-prem. But the idea is that you're trying to consolidate. That all being said, the 12-factor app website is absolutely something, it's it's still 15 years later. This is pre-Docker ideas. They still hold up. There's a couple of technology references that we've maybe supplanted, like talking about environment variables. And maybe if you're writing modern applications, you might use config maps to actually store secrets and things in files rather than environment variables, that's fine. When you see the word environment variables, you think they're really just talking about a simple sto a storage system that all my apps can gather their environment settings. You don't get too focused on that. They have a whole rule around automating and being able to ensure that the steps are consistent across your CI and deployment models. There's a whole bunch in there and it's really fast to read. You can read this if you're a slow reader, it, it just takes you an afternoon. If you're a fast reader, it's like an hour. Some of these pages aren't even a full page of content. They're just talking about, this is concepts of like application design, right? But one of, some of the best ones are about config and how you store your config. So the reason I'm bringing this up is, sure, we can talk about CI and CD and automating deployments, but if you don't have the 12-factor mindset, a lot of the other things that you're gonna need to do in automation and in deployment are going you're going to struggle with because you're not coming from this place of understanding the core problems and the core solution mindset that you need to have so to me the 12 factor app is a required reading just like i say devops handbook is a required reading these are fundamentals not necessarily going to help you implement CI. They're just the fundamentals of understanding why we exist as DevOps roles, right? Okay, that being said, let's get back to your question because it's a great one. Any certain points to consider when creating application architecture? I have to imagine that my application can run on my local machine in CI and in the cloud, and I don't want more than any one thing running in a single container. So I don't want my worker jobs and my API all running in the same container. So when you think about abstracting out the parts of your application, I don't care whether you go monolith or you go microservice or the middle ground there, which is what I like, which is it's not quite a microservice, not quite a monolith, right? I do break out the parts, the front end's the front end container, the back end's the back end container. We sometimes call that an API. There's maybe some worker jobs or cron job types things, worker processes, they're separate containers. Now these things may all exist in the same GitHub repo or in separate repos. I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. That's really a culture thing that you can do great works with either design of monolithic repos or many small repos. I tend to dance in the middle, right? I don't make more repos until it makes sense to make more repos, but I often have app repos and then a Kubernetes YAML repo and then maybe something like an Argo CD or my deployment tool, Flux, whatever I might be using for deploying my apps. That's a separate repo than my Kubernetes YAML. I want my application developers, developers and the DevOps people to all work together on that Kubernetes repo. And then I want my um, application developers to really not have to worry about anything that doesn't describe their, describe their app. I don't want them to have to worry about my Argo CD deployment designs. They can, I mean, they're gonna have access to see it, but I don't want them to be forced to learn their app, how to develop it, learn GitHub Actions or whatever the CI tool is, then learn Kubernetes YAML, which I will help them with. I don't think that they need to memorize all that unless they wanna be a Kubernetes admin. 
and then they're probably going to need to deploy it. And I don't need them to learn Argo CD, YAML, and how all of those different files need to be worked together. I want to help them with that as the operations slash DevOps role. Okay. And so if I go to github.com, I have an example organization. This is what I use inside of my Argo CD course, which if you want to learn more about Kubernetes deployments, GitHub Actions, Argo CD, GitOps, that's all in this course, by the way, you can go jump onto that and I will give you that link. So I'm gonna give you this link right here first. This is the important link. This is a GitHub sample organization where I break out my application itself, the workflows that I'm gonna use in CI, as well as where I'm doing my Docker builds and where I store my Kubernetes YAML and my Argo CD YAML. And so if you think of those tools as my CI workflows, my Kubernetes application design, like a compose file, right? Whether that's Helm or customize or just manifest, doesn't really matter. And then finally, my deployment YAML specification. And that's where I have all these repos. I, for example, have one just for the Argo CD YAML. And then I have another one for my Kubernetes YAML and that's per app. So this WordSmith app is what I'm deploying and I have a WordSmith front end repo, a WordSmith back end repo. There's a database component and a Redis style key value kind of thing maybe. And then I have a Kubernetes repo that has all of the default YAML for that application. So this is the thing where maybe if you're the DevOps expert, you are taking, maybe a developer's created Docker files. Maybe they've also created Compose. And they are going to give you that. And maybe if they don't know custom, Kubernetes, maybe they're gonna give you that and you help create the Kubernetes YAML. So they don't have to be the expert in the Kubernetes YAML. In this case, I'm using Customize, which is a very simple templating engine for Kubernetes. And there we go. And we got a guest in the green room. My co-host is here. Let me let me figure out how to bring him on. There we are. Sorry for being late, Brent. Thanks apologies, for being here. Apologies. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you're back. I was talking about a great question. Is there any certain points to consider when creating a deployment architecture of an application? And I was showing off the I was showing off on this sample awesome. organization that I have, kind of the repo design that you might consider. That's part of your application deployment is where are all these files gonna go? That's a very common question. Do I put things in my application repos? Do I have a separate repo for everything? And I do the middle. Like I'm, I try to make the DevOps YAML in a separate place. If it's not used for local development, I try to put it in a separate place. And then as the team's needs grow, I split it up only as needed. Like when we start having challenges with permissions and too many, if there's too many updates to a single repo and people are having a hard time, maybe we split it out. What do you, what is your opinion? How, do you have like your own preferences? Of course, it depends on the size of the team. I think that's the biggest. Yeah. I was just going to say, this is, it'll sound like a non-answer, but it's closer to truth, which is you need to mirror your organization, organizational structure, or what you choose will dictate your organizational structure. So it's like. You want to pick which direction you want to go with this, right? If you're working somewhere where there exists an organizational structure, you're going to have to think about whether you want to match uh, microservices, the repos, the content to that organizational structure and the culture within those teams, right? Do those teams have a SRE mentality? Are they responsible for, are like, are they on call? Are you replacing me with ChatGPT while I'm responding to your question? <laughs> Oops. No, because ChatGPT did not answer my question and got it wrong. <laughs> while you were talking, Am I, I was going to ask do you, I do, you have, do I still have a job? <laughs> there was, I, I was actually I was watching a video last night. I didn't about, know this. Go ahead. I'm like, we're all like a tangent of a tangent here. But the, the tangent I was going down was I watched a video last night about the state of mathematics and the LLMs. And it was this someone, I can't think of her name. She has like over a million uh, subscribers on YouTube and she's a mathematics, I guess she's a professor maybe, she's a pro. And she's showing that there's this worldwide mathematical, I think it's a geometry problem. And like the state of LLM, it's like, it's like the IBM challenge in chess, right? Back in the day. Yeah, and you're yeah. just, and she's showing the graph of like over time, how LLMs have now exceeded 
all but the world champion in speed of solving problems in geometry. I think it's specifically geometry. Anyway, so she's, we're, we're not replaced yet as humans, but even it's even now faster than the people that compete for the world championship. They're just not, it's just not as fast as the world champion, but we're like probably weeks away from that happening. But yeah, even <laughs> geometry. And she was like, I think the title of her video was, do I need, a, do I need to be worried about my job? <laughs> The answer is no and yes at the same time. It's yes. No, what I was going to ask you was, do you remember that what that's called? The software, your the representation of how your software is designed is naturally des always going to look like your organizational structure. And there's like a law or it's like, more, uh, it's like it's Moore's Shannon's? law or something like that. Where is it Shannon's law? No, it's, it's there is a, as I'm frantically Googling. Yeah. Conway's law. Conway's law. There we go. I'll put this in the chat. This kind of dictates a lot of... Well, that states that organizations <laughs> design know, systems that, that mirror their own law. communication structure. Law. At first, I thought that said marital law. And I was like, what? <laughs> Those dictate structure too. But yeah, back to what I was trying to say, Brett. You either match your repo structure and CICD processes and automation to your existing stru organizational structure or you adapt your organizational structure to end state architecture that you're trying to achieve. And for those who've followed the kinds of talks I've done for a long time and followed DevOps topic that I've talked about a lot, it's about that. It's about the cultural aspect and the meat space aspects of the things that we talk about, right? Like we like, we love to talk about the technologies and they definitely have a big impact, but I would argue, my argument is that you can have the most amazing V tooling and like get architecture and YAML generating application on the planet. If you don't resolve any of your organizational or structural or how people interact and work together, it's only going to take you so far and likely is not going to be successful as much yeah. as we want the technology just to fix it, fix all yeah. those things. It's like, if you wanted to make it different, it's almost like the, it's the default nature of the, the style and size and culture of your organization yeah. to be reflected in your software. And it's not impossible to pre prevent it, but it's the default nature. So for example, a single individual or what I would call a solo DevOps likely means that they're doing a ton in one repo. And they're probably not considering multi, they're probably doing things that only work on their machine. Like they maybe are using Terraform by default with the Terraform file on their local machine and not putting it in central storage. And there's habits that they mm -hmm. will accidentally stumble into even when they want to resist it. That's why in my consulting, the way that it motivates me to not do that, because I'm the solo DevOps person a lot of times, the way I, I, I approach it is that I, I want to be replaced. <laughs> I think about every day when I'm working, if I do this and only I know how to do it and I only have the, I'm the only one with the permissions or the access or whatever, then I'm not replaceable and I don't want this job forever. So I want to be able yeah. to go do other fun things. And so I don't know if you can all have that mindset, but if you have the idea of, I, I need my exit to be easy and that's not so much I need to be replaced, but it's, I need to be able to move on to the next greener pasture at any time and not feel like I'm leaving a mess of things that no one else will know how to do and it's not documented and it's not yeah, reflected in the design. If you keep that mindset, I find that it's a healthier design. That, that solves the yeah. small teams. It doesn't solve the problem of big, complicated, like how do these big, I'm always amazed on like how Apple ships updates so reliably and so consistently, yeah. and yet despite I, they have hundreds of thousands of people and tens of thousands of engineers, like it seems simple to us, but that's a real skill that they're doing uh, that. Absolutely. Before I joined AWS, I've seen, I, I've worked on and helped implement some organizational structure and DevOps practices, both on the cultural and tooling side for organizations of various sizes. But now I'm on like this side of the fence at AWS and watching how we deploy services and do region build outs and things like that. It's absolutely, it's very mind blowing. It's yeah. both, yeah, I, there's some really good, we're pretty transparent about how we do, when I say we, AWS is very transparent about how they implement 
what, before DevOps practices, before DevOps existed, right? So a lot of this stuff was created because it needed to exist to just yeah. be able to do the scale that, that AWS runs at. And we've done a lot of tooling and, and created a lot of things to, that didn't exist, right? They just had to create it because they couldn't buy something off the shelf. And a lot of those lessons learned are embedded in DevOps practices today, in the tooling, in how we think about managing deployments and even things like team sizes and developers being their own SREs responsible for their production environment, things like that. Like all that comes from not only like Apple and other companies, but AWS as well and lessons from deploying at, at scale. There was some, there's some great videos from reInvent over the years describing how all that stuff works. What's it's really my blind inside baseball or yeah how the yeah is it how the cookies are made or what's i don't know what that was that analogy how the sauce is made yeah we'll say with sauce we'll, we'll go with sauce sauce <laughs> wow Every time I going right sauce, to fl- like... joining and going right for phil got really philosophical right? <laughs> I don't know the bat. I, I mean at the deep end that's what happens when you come in halfway through <laughs> Ooh, fair <laughs>